thank you so much for coming to our panel tonight uh, about social media in PR. And we have some great panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. Just to get us started, my name is Don Gilpin. I'm an assistant professor here at Cronkite. I teach classes in public relations, and I also teach a class in social media at uh, the R Tempe campus. Um, the way I'm going to structure this tonight is we're just going to have kind of an informal living room discussion with our panelists about some uh, current issues in social media and the media professions in general. And uh, then I will open it up to Q&A from the audience. I'm also, we're also going to have uh, on the monitors displayed the Twitter feed of the hashtag for tonight's event, which is Kronk MSM for Must See Monday. So uh, we'll be able to follow any live tweeting that might happen. And uh, if you want to let anybody uh, know who couldn't be here tonight, we're also going to open up to um, questions from other people via Twitter. Or you can submit your own question via Twitter. We, we don't discriminate. Uh, no location-based uh, discrimination. OK, so that's how it's going to work. Uh, let me introduce our panelists tonight. We have Jennifer Gail Hellum. She's a multimedia journalist and a social media specialist with an undergrad degree in journalism and PR from Wisconsin, and she is one of our master's program graduates. Um, most recently, she was in charge of mobile search and social media for AZ Central, and she's really uh, very well known for her work and personal branding, and she has a blog on the topic called Brand Me, which seems appropriate enough. And we have Chris Klein. He's a four-time Emmy Award winner. He's currently director of new media for ABC 15. Uh, he keeps himself busy with ABC15.com, ABC Mobile, uh, and social media for ABC15 in general, plus maybe has also a personal life. Uh, he strives to, he likes to say he strives to bring the past and the future together through intentional innovation. So he should have some exciting things to say about um, trends and directions in social media for us. And last but not least, we have uh, Ashley Oakes, who's a public relations and social media specialist at Zion and Zion right here in the Valley. She is also a graduate of our esteemed institution. She sits on the board of the local chapter of the Public Relations Society of America. She's very active on Twitter, both for herself uh, and on behalf of her company, as well as obviously the work she does with her clients to help them communicate effectively using all the different tools available to us. So we ha should have some really interesting discussion going. I always feel very talk show host-ish when I sit here. So <laughs> there's no exciting gossip, though, which is probably for the best. Um, so to get us started, I want to lay some groundwork and make sure we kind of have our terrain defined. So I'd like to ask each of you to briefly define what you mean by social media. There are lots of different, there's not even a perfect agreement on what is social media. So um, for the context of tonight, um, let's start with Ashley and work our way down this way. What do you see as social media? Um, social media to me is, you know, effectively communicating online, depending on what tool you're using, it doesn't really matter as long as you're you know, getting the word out there, especially with me for my clients, it's depending what the perfect mix is for them. So with social media, you kind of have to fine tune it and decide from there. Okay, so any kind of online communication yeah. is social media for you. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, I think the definition has definitely evolved over the past couple of years. And for me, it really just comes down to one word and that's engagement. Mm -hmm. Social media is anything and any place where you can engage with your audience on a one-to-one -one ratio. That may have been Facebook and Twitter a couple of years ago only, but there are so many more options now where you could say the exact same, same things happen, and that makes it a little more interesting to define and troublesome. Right. Yeah, it's hard to lay some boundaries when it goes in so many different directions, and so many traditional websites are incorporating, <coughs> sorry, incorporating social media features into their websites or platforms, so it's kind of all blurring together. Jennifer. Well, I think it's important to be a little narrower at, at just in clarifying that social media, although it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's also mass at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you're not having discrete private conversations. You may be having conversations with one person, but you have an audience out there, um, an, un an unknown audience. You may, you know, even on 
uh, Facebook, you may think you know everybody, but now with the subscribe feed, you actually often don't. Um, and then the other element of it is the, um, what is the user generated content. That's an important piece of social media. Yes, uh, clearly since I do teach a class in social media, can't see. I can help you if you go up. Can you go up this way? There you go. <laughs> All right, there we go. So this is how we handle things. Like you're on the fly. It's a live show. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, when I am teaching the classes on social media or teaching about it, I also um, try to define things pretty narrowly. And I agree that for me, one of the key elements is that it takes place in a, in a public or semi-public uh, space. So I would distinguish between email, which I don't think is a form of, it's a form of communication clearly, but I wouldn't define it as social media because even though you can forward emails to people um, on purpose or accidentally, uh, you, it still not, doesn't have that same quality of public and semi-public um, thing, but that's my thing. All right, so we're talking about, basically all of you are saying we're talking about um, engaging people, communicating with people, interacting with people online, in some form, and having conversations is also part of sharing user-generated content and um, engaging in conversations. Okay, so um, let's go to, what do you think, since we have kind of a good representation of different areas of journalism and PR, and what do you see as the boundaries of these areas? Do you think um, that there are differences um, in the re as a result of social media in these two fields? Um, do you think they're moving farther apart, closer together, the same, changing? Let's start with Chris. I think it, for the TV world, is very natural because for so long TV has been about creating that relationship and in many ways putting on the show in order to create a warm feeling. And so that transfers so naturally to social media and to have an anchor like Katie Rammel, who you can now follow on Facebook, or who can tweet to you or tweet at you. It's just an extension of what we've started. I think in other areas, perhaps it's, it's been a bit more challenging to introduce it because it might be a little more uncomfortable, but I think everyone is focusing and, and um, driving towards kind of the same place, which comes back to that word for me, engagement, and finding ways to build affinity for your brand, whether that's a TV station or a business, and finding ways for people to create an emotional connection with you. And all three of us use social media for business ends, as a lot of folks who are here and watching do too. So when it comes down to it, I think you've got to look at it from that end. Great. The same way that they um, build those relationships with their viewers, it goes along those lines with us to the media because we're able to reach out to them in another platform where we might not be able to get them on the phone or email them um, and get a response. But if we make that relationship where they see us more as a peer or more as a normal person than just a PR person, because they're seeing like we're checking <laughs> in at this restaurant that they love to go to, you know, where we're making that different connection with them and we're making that small chat with them online, it kind of builds that relationship for us in a way too. Right, so not just in terms of um, where the professions of PR and journalism are going, but also in terms of the kinds of relationships that you can make with each other to work together. I remember when I was a grad student here, we had the opportunity to have lunch with Jim Vandehei from Politico. And I asked him, hold on a second, we're getting the invasion and I'm losing my mic again. <laughs> we're getting the in invasion of people leaving the session there. I just want to make sure make sure to speak uh, clearly and loudly so that uh, the background noise is covered up. Uh, as I was saying, when I was a graduate student here, I had the opportunity to have lunch with Jim Vandehei from Politico, and I already was interested in social media, and I asked him if they had a social media editor at Politico, and he said, you know, we want to have one, but we don't know where to put that person. We don't know if it's PR, we don't know if it's editorial, we don't know if it's tech. And I said, it's all three. 
So, you know, having a background, an undergraduate degree in advertising and public relations made my graduate experience, um, the gave it the, the natural attraction to, to social media, I think, was there because there is that PR element. You're promoting, at least in the newsroom at AZ Central, where we had a converged newsroom, uh, we're promoting the online product, the TV product, and the newspaper product while we're sharing information about our stories and in a promotional way, but also in building the in connecting the community that's out there um, receiving the, the stories that we're telling. So I think it, that there's definitely a PR element to it because you're saying, hey, come over here, check out what we have. Trying to get their attention. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think, Ashley, you made a really interesting point when it comes to the types of posts that work. It's one thing to say that we should all use social media to promote this or promote that. But I think your point about building the personal connection through through the things that you do is critical to the success of social media. And all of us have probably found that as we've worked through, um, through wins and losses with what works and what doesn't in terms of interaction. The posts that don't work are the posts that feel like TV or newspaper or PR. The posts that do work have to be written in a completely different way than what any of us are used to for those other mediums. There is a social language, right? And you have to talk in a very unique way to get that engagement, whether that's through questions, true, false, short snippets that people can look at as they're on their Facebook news feeds, photos, videos. It's, it's a job, to your point. A social media editor is, is something that everyone should be thinking about, even if it's not financially viable. Maybe it's someone in your organization that has a knack for it, they can do it part-time. Yeah, I think that a lot of organizations, including media organizations, are challenged by this new area that doesn't fit neatly into previously defined, you know, places on, a, on an organizational chart, you know, that they're having to create. It's interesting that, that something like Politico, which is in and of itself kind of boundary spanning a startup, you know, if it was, um, that was something new that came out, um, that even they would be sort of locked into this, oh, we haven't done it because we can't figure out how to label it. Um, like the label has to come before the position, if you feel a need for it, you would think you could create it. But I think that's really hard. Organizations typically don't change that easily. Um, well, I think a lot of it has to do also with social media has to show and prove its worth for a lot of companies to invest in it. And it's one thing to say, I have 5,000 people following me, but it's another thing to turn that into something tangible and to actually see the newspaper circulation grow or the TV ratings climb or 500 extra people at the business that you're trying to promote. Uh, but when you are able to find those successes, those are the things that you hold up and those are the ways that you finally get that body or are able to take an existing position and move it in order to take things to the entirely next level. Yeah. I think a couple of years ago, we used to hear a lot, oh, social media are just a fad. And when I would teach things about Twitter, they're like, why do I have to learn? This is so stupid. It's going to be gone in a year. Um, so first it was first social media are just a fad. And then the second wave was, OK, maybe it's going to be around a while. So we'll just collect a whole bunch of numbers, right? We'll just get lots of fans and followers and do whatever we can to have fans, friends, followers, whatever it is on whatever platform you're doing. But then it was like, okay, now what? What do these mean? What do these translate into? Um, so that's kind of what you were. Well, and I think Facebook perhaps is the best example of that right now because as most folks in this room may know, there's now a new number below your fan count, and it's called the people talking about this number. And in many ways, I'd argue that that's more important than your fan count, because if you don't know what the people talking about us number does, is it aggregates the likes, comments, interactions, shares, all the stuff that people are doing with your posts. And that's what you want. Are. That's the value. And uh, so we have actually 
stopped looking at our fan count as the definitive number to show growth and started looking at that talking about this, talking about us number, because that's how broadly we're reaching people. Right. Yeah. Because having, you know, it takes half a second to hit the like, you know, button or whatever, but that doesn't mean people are actually following you or engaging you. They can, they can hide, hide you. They can hide you. Yeah. <laughs> And on Twitter, you know, if people ha are following several hundred or thousands of people, they may or may not see your tweet. So I agree, you know, in terms of engagement. But, but in journalism, typically, you know, PR has always been about engagement and interactions and building relationships. So it's interesting. Why do you think that journalism, which typically has been more about broadcasting, literally, you know, um, getting information out there. Why do you think that these changes are happening now that there's an interest in the engagement dimension? Well, the, the process was disrupted. The gatekeeper lost his job in some ways. He lost his gate? <laughs> <laughs> lost his gate. There, with, you know, it, traditionally, you know, in old media, the editors made the decisions of what people were talking about. They deliver the stories and, um, you know, some people responded to them by writing letters to the editor. Some picked up the phone and called their stations. And a few were privileged to have their voices shared in some, some capacity. And now everyone's voice is shared. It's, you know, immediately in a, in a tweet, you know, this is stupid. This is great. Check this out. It's on Facebook. The conversation starts with the publication of the story instead of ending with it. So the power, I'd say, has kind of shifted from the gatekeepers to the gate crashers. Right. Like, in yeah. some ways, I mean, there's still, you know, you still are making editorial decisions, but the conversation about that story gets to continue as long as the, the public or the community is interested in it. And that opens up an entirely different Pandora's box, which is once you have all of these folks who are engaging, what rules and moderation tools do you put in place? And when someone says something that is very negative about your business or your organization, are there ever justifications to remove that? Or do you let that live and breathe at the top of your wall? Right. And those are all difficult conversations. And on Twitter, you don't even have the option. It's right. there. <laughs> right. So what do you do? In um, situations that I've had for clients, um, if it's a customer relations sort of situation where, say, it's a pizza company and they didn't deliver the right pizza, it's the role of them to always address it and apologize and make sure that you can make it right. But if it's somebody that's blatantly just trying to be negative on your page, um, they're just you know, saying vulgar things, then that's a different level of where you have to make that decision. Am I gonna block this person because you know, they're not here for any purpose other than to just try to hurt the business. So there is that sense where you have to take things offline too when you're doing your customer relations. Um, situations and I always ask them you know can you email me here I want to figure out what happened can we make this right that sort of thing so um, it's taking it to that level with a customer to making sure that you are responding and making it publicly known that you're responding to them right if they make a public complaint or something about you you want to make sure that it should that it's there's a public record that you are addressing right. it and taking steps because if somebody even on like a Yelp account, if somebody were to come to Yelp to look at the reviews and they do notice some negative reviews, but they notice that the business owner is responding, they're going to take a different, um, you know, approach to reading that than if there was no comment left from the business owner and it's just negative reviews. Or if it's like some of the situations that we've seen where business owners kind of flip out. Right. <laughs> where they're not treating the customer the way that they should be treated if they were in their restaurant. So... But the, the problem there is that when someone flips out and they do a vast or massive delete, you run the risk of ruining that trust. And once you've lost trust, you've lost everything. So regardless of what rules you set, and I think every organization is going to have different rules for different needs, the key is being overt about that, making sure that they're posted, making sure that people know what you're doing and why, and then holding all posts and social media platforms to the same level playing field. So one of the complaints that you often hear about social media in general, but sometimes more particularly aimed at uh, media professionals of various kinds, from journalism to PR to marketing, is that it tends to encourage self-promotion 
over speaking for a brand or an organization or something, and that um, so that there's there's the boastfulness aspect of it, um, and that even independent professional individual journalists are encouraged to develop their personal brand, right, and develop a an identity independent of their employer or um, whatever their employment status is as part of also a career trajectory, right? You make yourself known and then you become a commodity that is in demand by maybe increasingly prestigious uh, places of business or you have more opportunities. So, so we're going to turn first to our personal branding uh, expert about what do you think about those accusations or those thoughts? Well, I think often those arguments come from people who've come up through um, the traditional media at a time when um, promoting your work was simply done by uh, sending out a resume when you're interested in a job. The game has changed. You know, when I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1989, my colleagues and I sent our resumes out. We looked at job postings. We hoped we got a call. And you know, maybe if we had a request for a reel or for a portfolio, we got to share what we could do. The game has changed. You now have, and you're all so fortunate because you don't have to, job to be, have to have a job to be able to show what you can do. You can create your own portfolio pages. You can create a blog. You can put your work out there and people can find you. And you can find others doing the same kind of work. You can ask them how they got their start. You can ask them, uh, you can look at the uh, job postings and see what kind of work they're looking for, for the jobs you want to do. And you can find people already doing that work and say, hey, how do you learn how to do that? So there are so many tools out there. And to play the game the old school way and sit back and wait for work to come to you or to be asked to show what you can do puts you at a disadvantage against everybody else who's figured out how to do it. Television stations have been promoting their talent from the beginning. Um, newspapers, you had a byline. Well, maybe you didn't have to do that because the newspaper industry had kind of a farm league to the big leagues progression to the career arc, but it's not that way anymore. The sports analogy is interesting because I've heard this comparison a lot of that um, the same thing is happening in pro sports and particularly certain ones that more than others like basketball where the players really are encouraged to develop their individual brand and they have their own personalities on say Twitter or Facebook and interact with fans and that's part of their brand development and there are That's the real of- challenge. It's the melding of the personal brand and the professional brand in a public sphere. Right. Before social media, you could separate the two. You could have your own, even in internet days, you could have your own website, but that was separate from your public facing brand. Now, it's awkward if you have two Twitter accounts, right? Can you imagine if you had um, Um, John Smith 1 and John Smith 2, and John Smith 1 was for work, and John Smith 2 was your personal life? I have four, so. (laughs) Yeah, it gets complicated. It gets gets complicated, and so. It is complicated. The challenge is in figuring out how, A, you can piece all of that together into one universal brand, or B, if you do need to keep them separate because the lives are too different, making sure that it's clear to folks what's what, and that you're not putting anything out there that is gonna jeopardize the other brand simply by association. Well, there are a few important concepts, principles. You know, um, everybody talks about the difference between their professional and their personal, but it's actually professional, personal, and private that you have to think about. Now that you're no longer just a byline and you're an image, and uh, a voice sharing um, commentary and posts, you have um, an interest from your public to share more about yourself. I'm a Packer fan, I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin, I have two kids, I'm interested in gifted education. All those things can be found on my Twitter page, on my Facebook page, but my private life is private. And I think that's a, a distinction that's not really talked about enough. Yeah, it's, I, I agree. I think that's kind of more the distinction. But it can still be complicated if a lot of your friends are also people that you might interact with professionally and they are maybe scattered around. I mean, I had a, I had a conversation last night about Buffy the Vampire Slayer on my professional account. <laughs> so it's not like I have, I'm afraid to share. And now I'm talking I saw about it in this room. You I did. saw it. I know who you were having that <laughs> so, with. Um, you know, it's not like, I think that it is, it is important to also have a personality because I think otherwise you become the one dimensional 
brand, and that is part of also that balancing act that you were talking about, I think. Um, because I think if you make too sharp a distinction, then you just, the purely professional is dry and boring. Nobody and there's wants no to reason follow to, it. Nobody yeah. wants to follow it, exactly. Nobody wants to engage with it um, if all you're doing is tweeting about you know, those kinds of things. But well, it's almost like it's not really you, in a sense. You know? Robot. But, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it you have to make like that the distinction. Ashley bot or the Chris bot. Or yeah. The <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to make that distinction of, okay, what I'm saying, what I say at a, a, ne a networking function, if I would, then I think it's fine, you know? Um, Facebook is a little bit different than Twitter. I think Twitter, your profile should be public. Facebook, maybe not so much. That is going to be, you know, a more personal level. For you guys, I know that you guys do the separate, like, ABC 15 accounts. So that's something where, you know, they are related to the station. But for a PR person, I don't want to create one that says Ashley Oaks, Zion, and Zion, you know, um, part of my Twitter handle, where if I were to go somewhere else down my career path, I'm not Ashley at Zion and Zion anymore, you know? Right. So it's, you have to make that distinction right away of I don't want it to be too professional where it's not me anymore. You know, I think Facebook recognizes this and you're starting to see them make changes to the way that profiles work in order to try to address this. Um, so, some of you may know that or, or use the new subscribe section mm -hmm. of a Facebook profile. What Facebook is for the first time allowing you to do is to post updates, but send them to different groups of people. So you can have one account, which you manage as one person, but every time you send out a post, it can go to a different group of people. And you can predetermine a work group, a personal group, a college group, and say, this is going to all three, this is going to one, this is going to two. And, and that may help that concept may help to break down some of these walls and barriers and tough conversations that we're all having. Yeah, I think that, that, that we see that happening, that's kind of one of the trends, right? We see it on Facebook, Google Plus has its circles, which have that same kind of function, that you can create these categories uh, like that. Uh, I think that is one of the challenges that a lot of people face, and when I'm teaching about social media, a lot of the questions are like, how to how do I deal with this, you know? And some of my students have accounts and they are very open about things despite some of my <laughs> suggestions that they might not want to be publicly discussing everything uh, that goes on in their life. But uh, when they become a little bit more aware of these boundaries though, they still are struggling with how can I be myself and, and use it as a tool to interact with my friends, maybe my friends who are scattered around the country from high school who went to colleges all over the place, and also not create a poor image. So what kind of, what kind of tips would you have for people, especially people who are planning to pursue a media career or taking their first steps in a media career for how to manage their online presence? We'll start with personal branding again, since that's right in your wheelhouse. Well, um, you know, for I'd like to back up just a second and talk about personal brands as um, just a way of defining what you uniquely bring to the conversation and to the profession. And what, and they're not effective if they're not not authentic. So having that personal voice is an essential element because otherwise it's not authentic. Everybody has a personal side to them. Um, but there, is, there are boundaries for that. Uh, one of the best analogies I was given was that Twitter is a work cocktail party and Facebook is friends in your living room. And if you're not sharing conversation, sharing information on Twitter um, because you think it's, it's valuable information to somebody else, maybe that should be taken into a, a DM Mm -hmm. a direct message or taken offline to a private conversation. If it's only valuable to the two people who are talking about it, it probably belongs in a private conversation. Okay. Of course, the, the friends in your living room depends also on what privacy settings you have set up on Facebook. Well, as far as the courtesies that, you know, we've oh. talked about, you know, um, what you would comment on. Um, but also, the, if you have a whole room full of people, with your friends, are you going to talk about intimate things? Or are you going to talk about something that's interesting to the whole room? If you're a, if you're a, a, a nice host. <laughs> when it comes to digital, I think 
regardless of settings, regardless of what platform you use, regardless of what and how you use those accounts, the rule is really simple. Don't post anything in digital, private or public, that you wouldn't want to get out there. Right. If you follow that rule, you're safe no matter what. Yeah, you know? that's right. And it, right, if you don't want it to go to be shared um, with people you don't know, then don't pay, don't post it. Yeah, uh, one of the one of the big challenges, I think. Well, no, it's just me, but like a lot of the work that's been done looking at privacy in online settings is. There are, there's a challenge, not just of what you choose to share about yourself or even what other people might share that you've posted or they might tag you in things or what, other, or what they might say about you in public places. But there's also the fact that all of it, since these are really all giant databases, all of this material is being stored and historically archived and much of it is searchable. And especially if anything reaches any degree of notoriety or, or uh, publicity attached to it, it's going to be, keep coming up over and over again and can always be searched. So it's kind of a permanent record. And for a lot of people, um, there's a great quote, I think it's by Jay Rosen, um, that says that often the worst thing you've done is the first thing people know about you. Because if they Google you, um, you know, if, and if you make a, a high profile mistake, like that poor young woman a, a few years ago who lost her job at Cisco because she said something unfortunate about the job she had just been given and they pulled it from her and it became a big story that was covered. Now, anytime somebody makes a faux pas on Twitter, it gets dredged up again. You can easily Google it and, you know, her name is attached to it and everything. And so it's it's tough for the, I know we're getting off topic a little, but in the last year, oh, I have gotten more phone calls from folks who we did stories on in social media or online who were charged with something, but later uh, all the charges were dropped. And they're now trying to retroactively clean up their digital image. And it puts media organizations in a really tough spot where we have to a, make the decision that we're going to go clean that up, or B, we're going to leave it alone and call it an archive, uh, or C, we're going to find some middle ground. But it all comes down to resources and figuring out what we need to do as journalists and what we should do as people, and it's, it's a difficult thing. Yeah, the, the terrain has really changed. I suppose, I guess that is tricky. I mean, if they were just accused of it, they were accused of it, but it, nothing right. went through with it. But it does, you know, I can see not really wanting that to be out there. Um, about Do you. you guys have a policy about deleting things that you've already posted online? Uh, everything's on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, the, the record's the record. It, it becomes a question of whether or not we should be amending that or whether the fact that the story was posted six months ago with information tied to that event, if that suffices. And if that's clear enough for the audience out there to make their own judgments about, okay, this is just an accusation from six months ago, and if I go and look up the court record, those charges were later dropped. The, the problem is if we, if we did, if we went through and cleaned up every single story, that would be another full-time job. Well, and I think it also goes back to what both of you have mentioned, that the keys lie in trust and authenticity. And if people know that there was a, something, but then the record, any record of it has been expunged, that gets into tricky, aside from et tricky ethical territory, but also leads to a lack of trust, right? And in authenticity, because of, can I tr trust them to maintain records of things that have happened, even if, you know, they're the historically, historical evolution went in a different direction and how much of what is there is credible and real or, you know, maybe can somebody buy them off to get, I mean, I think it plants a lot of doubts and right now in this media environment, it's, it can be really, there's a lot of tricky decisions to be made. Um, well, and a lot of it comes back to each individual and the necessity to, regardless of what else is posted out there, to make certain that you're doing what you can in your own environment to 
let folks know what is there, what is inaccurate, and figuring out ways to use your own personal websites, branding, social media accounts to address those things because there's only so much you can control. I can't control what's on azcentral.com. She can't control what's on abc15.com and, you know, a million different things. But I can control what's on my social media accounts and what's on my website. Well, this raises interesting questions from a PR perspective, especially when it comes to reputation management um, in general, in particular in crisis situations or problems verging on crisis situations. You know, crisis is kind of an overused word, but uh, in terms of where is the responsibility and how do you handle things with clients, for example, who may be doing some of their own social media work, but then they rely on you. I mean, how do you negotiate those boundaries about who does what and when, when you intervene? And do you have to have frequent discussions about um, well, most handle? of my clients, we come up with the content for them. Um, that's part of our retainer with them. But there are cases where we do have clients that have been doing it in-house and they decide to still do it in-house. Um, and we always will give our expertise to them. Um, there hasn't been any problems, per se, where a crisis communication came up that we weren't handling it ourselves. But there is that distinction where if we say, if they do start doing something that we don't agree with, then we do tell them, you know, you probably shouldn't address it that way. This is how I would do it. You know, letting them be the final say, but still telling them this is probably what you should be doing. Um, yeah, it gets complicated because once upon a time, and you could still have those arguments, but at a certain point, they would have a lot more difficulty going directly to the mainstream media. Whereas now, if they disagree, they might be out there. Um, oh, yeah, and tweeting. more of a PR standpoint, yeah. um, not just social media or like review marketing, that sort of thing. Um, we always ask them to address the problem right away, and you know, we'll help get the word out to the media if something you know, some crisis communication sort of happened, so. But with social media, it's a lot easier, like they can post something on their website if there is something going on, if they have a blog or something about that, they can address it there. On their own social media accounts, they can address it. So it's helping show that they are addressing the problem instead of just being silent, because when people start looking for it, if they have a, a higher SEO ranking for their website, you know, maybe something with those keywords will pop up right away, and they'll read that, what the company is saying, instead of what else is being said somewhere else that isn't ranked as high. So it's always being proactive in that sense online, too. What about in, uh, in other kinds of media organizations when problems arise? What kind of, have you encountered any kind of difficulties in figuring out who's going to be responsible for managing the reputation of the organization? Or you've, you've got to identify people at the beginning who are your points. And for us, we have someone who is the default point at 4 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., and 10 p.m., uh, and overnight, too, because to, to Ashley's point, what you can't afford to do is to not address an issue and to let it sit. And the quicker you can respond, regardless of whether or not it's a negative issue, the more understanding often you find that that person tends to be because there's actually someone acknowledging them, speaking to their issue, and when you feel heard, use your own experiences. When you feel heard, regardless of what you get out of that, you tend to feel a little better about it because at least someone's listening. Right. You're not just talking to a void, which a lot of people... A thank imagine. you goes a long way sometimes is a simple comment. Well, before I open this up to uh, our audience for Q&A, uh, you know, as I mentioned when I emailed you all, one of the curses of being associated with social media is people are always asking, what's the next big thing? Um, but I'd like, so I'd like to ask actually a double-barreled question. Uh, what's, what do you think is, what are some trends? Let's put it a little bit more manageable question, because honestly, if we knew the next big thing, we would probably be somewhere else. But um, the, what, what, what trends do you see happening in social media and um, that you think are of interest to people in media professions? And what do you think is a platform that 
is not getting as much attention as it should or is underused or most improperly used? We'll start with Ashley. Um, I would say trend-wise right now, a lot of social mediums are coming together and integrating. So making sure that your clients from a PR perspective are doing that with all of their marketing materials um, and kind of integrating everything together is key right now, just because you want people to stay on your brand as long as possible. So taking them from one platform to the next is what you want to do, essentially. Um, as far as up and coming, I think something that a lot of PR people do forget is the review management. So making sure that you are staying on top of what people are saying to you and not just your brand talking, but listening to what else is being said about them out there. So always keeping that in mind as well. Great. This, this may be counter, but in terms of an underappreciated social media medium, I think Facebook is entirely underappreciated by wow. so many people. Okay. Uh, not necessarily in the personal realm, but in the professional realm. People aren't using it as well as they could. People aren't engaging in the ways that they realistically could to be getting yeah, We hurt. should have a page, but then they don't really know what to do with it. Exactly, that. exactly. If more people understood how they could use Facebook, there would be a lot more success stories out there than even there are today. And in terms of trends, I think it comes down to mobile and location-based technology. As more people are getting iPhones and smartphones and they're able to keep track of social media on the go, you're finding this interaction never stops. It's 24-7. Think, think about this. When you wake up, what's the first thing you do? You probably turn to your cell phone before you're even out of bed or when you're in the bathroom. You've got Sometimes that cell phone in hand. You're looking at your email. You're looking at your Facebook page. And that's a huge trend. That speaks to how important this is in our lives and how important it's going to become. Great. Jennifer. Well, I, I'm coming to the social media discussion from um, uh, not just a branding perspective, but also from a reporting perspective. Right. So the, tool, the social media platform that I think is least um, understood and exploited by reporters is LinkedIn. Oh, I think it's tremendously useful. Um, if, if you have the opportunity to look at LinkedIn for, uh, LinkedIn for journalists, it's a page on the site that's run by Krista Canfield. She comes from PR, but she, um, um, she comes from journalism, but she now is um, part of the PR team. And she does a free um, conference call every six weeks for journalists to walk them through all the different ways you can use LinkedIn as a reporting tool to find sources, to follow trends, to find story ideas. And it, it expands your Rolodex because you're not going to the same sources every time when you need someone to talk about a particular topic. And you can find an expert within a 10 mile radius who has five years experience or 10 years experience, you can find a belly dancer in your community if you're doing a story wow. on belly dancing, because <laughs> you know, people li list their interests. It's just totally underused by journalists. Interesting, okay. And what about trends that you're noticing? Um, well, what everybody seems to be talking about right now is Pinterest. Mm, okay, even for reporting? Well, I, what I did see was that the Neiman Lab just had a blog post about how the Wall Street Journal used it for covering Fashion Week. Yeah, yeah. you know, so seems it, ideal for something like that. Yeah, so there are little niche uses for it. I don't know yet if there are going to be other ones, but as far as trends, that seems to be the hot thing everybody's talking about right now. That's something that we are exploring for some of our um, company clients um, is using Pinterest in a sense of getting their products out there, but at the same time, not necessarily just their products, but putting other things out there that would help somebody that would be their target audience. Um, so that's something that we are doing right now too. Right, not just promoting a specific client, but clients who are interested in this probably have these associated. Right, but sneaking in their products here and there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, point, organizing that community that's interested in that category of products. Right, because people go there and browse a lot through all these different, by, by keywords and stuff about the pretty pictures of things. Interesting. Okay, great. Well, we've had some, you know, touched on a lot of different topics, but uh, now it's time for you to ask your questions about the use of social media and PR and media in general and 
any questions that you might have for us, you can also submit questions via Twitter or invite your friends to submit questions via Twitter. I just have a quick question. Um, recently, my up? boss has tasked me with looking into Google Plus, and it's kind of sketchy what I've found so far um, in people using it for businesses. So I'm curious to see what you guys think about it. Anybody have thoughts on Google Plus? I got on Google Plus right when it came out, and I noticed that it died off really fast. So I have a feeling it's going to turn into another Google Buzz that just goes away. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of brands started going on it, and I've noticed that you know it's one of those things you have to decide: is it worth the effort, mm -hmm. or you know is it one of those things that you do put into your social media mix? So as far um, as my agency, we've started Google Plus pages for some of our brands, but um, not for all of them. Okay, what, what, is there a commonality among those that you found it to be more useful for? Like, or a reason that they're there and the others are not? Um, not necessarily. It's just um, more of to help their Google Places page rank more. Um, so more for SEO purposes than necessarily like social media purposes. So not so much for a conversation. Right. What about you guys? Well, I think they've made an error in um, not allowing brands to have pages. They do now. But they, but didn't, they didn't allow it right when all the buzz was happening, mm. when all the news organizations and reporters and um, people who share information and talk about trends um, could have ju jumped, were eager to get in there and have a page. They couldn't then. And then the hype went away, and then they came back, oh, you can now. And I think the interest had already waned. And it was just too much like having a Facebook page. Interesting. The Chris? one thing that I know is if you have to start buying ads like TV commercials to promote your social medium, then it's probably not naturally working for you. So that's one thing when, that I noticed about it is when that started happening, it just, it didn't, you know, you shouldn't have to do that. It should be a viral spread naturally. My, my recommendation is unless you have a full social media team, you're much better off putting your efforts towards the established networks where you know you have the potential to reach folks because with Google, it just doesn't have the breadth and depth that it needs to right now. And most organizations probably don't want to be putting their time there until it grows. Yeah, I think it becomes, I will admit, I am a, a Google Plus user. I also use it in my classes a lot. I think it has some advantages over definitely over Facebook or Twitter for, for certain uses, but from, a, from a, an organizational perspective, I could see, I mean, if I were in charge of communication in an organization, I could see using it more internally at first, having a presence there externally, unless I were in a tech field where it is a lot more integrated. Um, I think the, the tech companies have jumped on a lot more, but for me, Google Plus is like any other social medium in that it all, it's all a question of critical mass. So if you know people, I also have students tell me Twitter is stupid and pointless. I don't know anybody who's on Twitter. So I think it depends a lot on your own social network. A lot of people I know, since I know a lot of tech people, also they are, uh, there's, a, there's always stuff going on in my Google Plus feed um, that's of interest. So I think that just really depends on who, who you know and who you connect to and where they tend to communicate. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, was, it would probably be worth setting up a page, but I don't know that I would invest a whole lot in it for right now in terms of Google+. But it's always good to know how things work. Another question. Yeah, getting to the point we were talking about earlier about uh, someone who was charged but then acquitted you know, of a particular issue and, and, and the trail that that leaves, obviously, in the media. Um, are you familiar with entities like a reputation recovery or something like this, and, which I think they basically just try to outsmart like the Google algorithm or something with a lot of maybe phony sites or artifacts? Do those, what, what do you think of those, or how do those work? Go for it. <laughs> I, 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 can only, I, I can't speak much to, to what they would do with Google in terms of outsmarting the algorithms. Uh, that's obviously something that we're trying to do all the time too with search engine optimization. But one thing I failed to mention, which I think um, bears mentioning on this conversation is uh, most new sites out there have expiration dates on their articles. 
And for the longest time, I was always frustrated by the fact that our articles expired after a year or two. But I've started to look at it from a different perspective and realize that outside of notable, important events, having articles that have a life and that have a death creates an opportunity for people to have clean slates too. Mm -hmm. And that, over time, helps to address some of these issues where a story from six years ago isn't searchable on Google via AZ Central or ABC 15. And that has advantages and disadvantages, but it, it, it perhaps helps address some of those concerns. Wouldn't it usually show up on a Google search anyway, but it just, if you clicked on it, then it would be a dead link. So you'd get the slug, but not the I actual I think so, story. but eventually then the, even Google has spiders that goes through and cleans up their own algorithms, right? Once it's gone from our site or your site, it may stay on Google with a dead link for a couple of months, but eventually Google's smart enough to clean that up too. Otherwise, you'd be finding millions of searches because how many websites disappear every day, you know? So it's a wasteland out there. Uh, Ashley, do you have any thoughts about these, these reputation recovery type uh, organizations? Um, as far as, you know, the algorithms, that's something that, like, even as professionals, we don't know that. So, I mean, in that sense, it's more of just trying to proactively use your own voice and post things. Like as a brand, we can post things and comment on things and say, well, actually, you know, or I'm sorry about that. So as far as algorithms, though, I yeah. couldn't get into that. I'm Usually, in my experience, those are services that charge you a lot of money for something that you can do yourself. Um, the usual recommendation is, it's not so much outsmarting the algorithms, which also uh, Google is very smart and they pay a lot of attention to tricks. And there's, um, you, can, you can be blacklisted from Google, uh, including by accident, if you hire a company, a lot, even some friends of mine have had run into this problem by hiring companies to do SEO for them. Um, and they engaged in what are called black hat practices, uh, like jamming a whole lot of keywords and that sort of thing, which is very frowned upon, versus actually providing content that people, the whole idea of good search engine optimization is people who want to talk to you and want to find you can find you, <laughs> right? So that's the whole point, not tricking things. Um, so I would be wary about any organization that claimed to be able to outsmart algorithms that they might engage in practices that could get you banned, blacklisted. But also, you know, you can, you can raise um, more positive things about yourself just by engaging more actively in social media yourself, um, since they're, they're swept pretty frequently by... Um, spiders, uh, search engine spiders, and they can find you, they can raise you up and lower uh, any negative things. That's a lot cheaper, probably. Other questions? Uh, I was glad Jennifer brought up um, Pinterest, um, because I'm wondering if there is a news application for Pinterest. I mean, um, uh, Liz, Smith is in here, but Liz actually set up a Cronkite Pinterest page. Um, and I was wondering if, if there would be, if you think there would be enough interest that people would um, aggregate interesting news stories or interesting coverage in Pinterest. I'm wondering about other app journalistic applications for Pinterest other than um, identifying trends for a story. Well, I haven't used it that much, but my understanding is that you're pinning video or images. So I don't know if you, if, if you could um, use it as a way to pin related stories to the stories that are being produced by Cronkite News Service or by Newswatch um, to pin work of alums. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I haven't yet seen them figure it out. Part of the issue is that it's invite only. Part of the issue is that it's Didn't they open up recently? I thought they opened up. You still have to, I think. Yeah, you still have it's to It's like 48 right? hours until you, you request an invite. 48 hours later, you get accepted. Ah, there's a delay. But, yeah, but, would, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I think to that point, we talked earlier about the fact that social media is its own language. And Pinterest may be the perfect example of where you have to look at it not from a brand perspective, 
but from a content perspective. And so instead of having an ABC 15 or just Cronkite Pinterest page, you might have to broaden your horizons and say, okay, I'm gonna have a Pinterest account about hiking in Arizona and let people pin up all the different places around the state that they wanna hike. And maybe I'll find a way within that account to throw my branding in there but I can't think of it like I do everything else. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would actually argue that's a good strategy from a PR perspective anyway, <laughs> that you don't want to make it all about your brand because very few people would. It has to be authentic. So, yeah. you know, to bring other content in there that somebody would find interesting and then also being able to relate it to your client, then that's how you want to do it. But along those lines, I know that a lot of... Um, um, broadcast and print um, are on Instagram, so it's more of a visual right. um, posting for them. And you can um, now, but you can now, can you post now from Instagram to pin, Instagram to Pinterest? I know you can do a well, Tumblr. Can basically, yeah, you can take any uh, URL and yeah, post but I mean, it on like here. when you when you take a picture, I know that oh, on you Instagram you can to, send you it directly to, to Tumblr and Flickr and yeah, because you can connect it to all your other accounts. Yeah, so, so it might be now. Kristen, I think I have an idea. Um, with um, the at AC Central, when we would get when there'd be a, a weather event, and on Facebook and Twitter, we'd ask everybody to share their photos. We, you know, post them on Scribble It Live or um, Cover It Live or uh, Scribble Live or Cover It Live, and um, you know, you end up with this really long stream and there are tweets mixed in there, and it might be a very um, comprehensive kind of place to collect all those audience generated photos from the scene for, of the weather of the you know it's usually weather that people love to share their their pic pictures Ooh, you're giving me that. ideas <laughs> well I can see because you usually have even within your own account you create interest boards right yeah. so I mean I can see doing it for community based journalism having things about you know art stuff going on around um, in downtown Phoenix or yeah. in Tempe or um, sports related yeah. photos or you know like you said hiking and outdoor activity type stuff and restaurants you know there's a whole foodie community out there that might want to look at, you know, the, and I know that there are already Pinterest boards about, you know, pictures of restaurants and food and that sort of thing. So I think something like that could be an interesting... Or for your sports page, you know, so that's where people who are at a sporting event can pin their post, their right. images. Yeah. Get people involved. I think we have time for one last question, if anybody's got one right up here. This might be more of a rant than a question, but I've uh -oh. had a private Twitter since like early 09 before I even came to Cronkite, and it was protected since then. And once I came to Cronkite, I think a few semesters in, I opened up uh, and created a new public one. And I think it makes a bad impression that I have a private one, but I'm not really, I'm not ashamed of anything on there. I'm not hiding anything from like a potential employer. I just have more private thoughts or conversations between friends that I'm not comfortable with anybody in the, you know, on Twitter or from all over the world being able to see. So I was wondering if there's any way to maybe kind of explain yourself if, you know, like just defend myself that I'm not hiding any bad things on my private Twitter. I just kind of wanted some privacy. You perhaps? said you do have a public. I have two, yeah, a public and a private. Do you cross-reference them in the bio section at the top of them? Um, this is my private Twitter account. You no, can follow you, me publicly on the other one. Would you recommend that? Absolutely. Okay. Especially if you're a journalist. To kind of establish mm -hmm. that, yeah. like, you know. So your colleagues can find you, so the people, people who want to um, send you story ideas or is contact your, you. Yeah, your, you regular name, your real name is on both accounts? Yeah. One's just, sh uh, I'm Courtney Bennett on one, and I'm Court Ben on the other. I, I think I mean, that... If, if Courtney Bennett's enough. your byline, then that's what your Twitter account should be. Okay. But, but if, if you're trying to, if you have two, and the idea is one is personal and one is public, then in addition to the, the bio idea, why not just change the name of make your it a pseudonym that, that one was to my be thought. something that's a little more personal and so when people search for Courtney Bennett they find your public account and that's really all they should find because your friends are going to know yeah. your your pseudonym yeah that's a good point 
But if you're, if you're on your Court Ben Twitter account, your name is listed as Courtney Bennett, then people are sure going to be able to Google you and find you that way, and they're going to find that Court Ben. And they may not bother to go to the other one. Perhaps even the name you use on your Court Ben one should be a name that's not yeah, I think that's what we're suggesting. Using oh, yeah. a pseudonym, changing yeah. the name of the account to yeah. a pseudonym so that they're yeah, sorry, completely I didn't understand you were talking separate. About okay, so yeah. you don't think it makes an I just have gotten the vibes that it makes a bad impression if you know you're you have a private Well if owner. if you have a if you have a pseudonym nobody will know okay. there that there's any relation I mean I'm pretty sure I don't know. I don't want to. It's not like a challenge or anything, but I don't think anybody can link my personal account to my uh, public account. Okay, that's comforting. It though. gets back to being clear and overt. As long as there's no confusion yeah. when people go to the pages, if it's in the bio, if the names are different, then you're okay. But the minute that it becomes too confusing for folks is the minute you're probably going to get a lot more of that feedback, or maybe that's why you're getting the feedback now. Well, for me, because if somebody were to apply to work at my agency and that is the first account that I found and I noticed you have like 10 followers and it's private, I'm like, well, she's applying for this social media job. Does she really know yeah. what social media is if she has a private account? And I don't really know if she's interacting on social media because that's important to us. So. Right. Yeah. This is what I also tell students about Facebook, that it's not that you might get in trouble because... You've done things that are horrible, hopefully, that are visible on social media. But it's the fact you're you're showing your judiciousness your and your your judgment and your ability to use social media effectively, and that's what people are going to judge you on. Some people might judge you on what you're actually doing, but you can't do <laughs> much about that. But um, mostly, they want to see that you know how to where to draw lines and also how to use these things effectively. Okay, great. I think we have reached the end of our time. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and joining us. And um, thank you very much to our distinguished guests for coming out. And it's been great. Thanks a lot.